I've made some progress on the engine. You can see I got the carburetor installed and the governor linkage, oil fill tube, dipstick, oil filter, coil distributor, plugs and wires, and the starter motor. And we're we're sort of ready to start this thing up. I got it filled with oil, but I need to need to get a baseline on the ignition timing. So here's my thought process on how to static time the engine. This distributor does not have mechanical points. It's a Pertronics electronic ignition unit and it's got a magnetic ring. I'm not sure exactly how it works if it's a Hall effect or or what it does. Anyway, I don't think that I can check it like I could with the points system. So if it had points, I'd just crank it around until we were top dead center on number one, turn the distributor until the, the points break open, you know, checking them continuity with the multimeter, and then we'd, we'd be very close to uh, the, the correct timing. But I can't do that with this engine because of the electronic unit. So what I think I'm gonna do I took the spark plug out of number one and I'm going to crank the engine around by hand until I feel compression on number one and then we'll run it to top dead center and we'll check that on the timing marks that are on the flywheel. You can see that there's a viewing port right here and then we'll rotate the distributor until it basically lines up with the uh, appropriate cylinder on the cap and then that'll get us kind of close. Hopefully it'll get us close enough to get it started and then we'll fine-tune it using the timing light. So I'll just bar it over. I got a ratchet and a socket on the front pulley and that the engine turns clockwise looking from the front. So... All right, I'm on the compression stroke on number one. So now I'll just line it up with the, the timing marks that are inside the flywheel. The engine's now on top dead center, cylinder number one on the compression stroke. So I'm just feeling for air coming around my thumb while I'm barring the engine over. And I lined up the timing marks on the flywheel at top dead center. Uh, the other thing you can do on these flathead engines, it's super easy. You can actually see the piston through the spark plug hole. So just make sure it's on top dead center. So what we're going for here is for the rotor to line up with one of the, one of the posts on the distributor. And it looks like it's pretty well lined up with this one right here. So I'm not going to turn the distributor, I'm just going to put the cap on. And then this post here is going to become number one. And then the distributor turns counterclockwise, so we'll just install our wires according to the firing order. One, five, three, six, two, four. So number five is here. Number three here. Number six here. Two and four. And then we'll install the coil wire in the middle. And that should be pretty close. Alright, I'll try to explain this ignition system. Hopefully it makes sense. So it's a simple system, but it's kind of hard to understand. So we have a distributor, a coil, and a ballast resistor. Now inside the distributor on this one is the Pertronics electronic unit, but before that they would have had points, so they're mechanical contacts that close each time that a cylinder needs to fire. And when those points close, it basically powers the primary winding of the coil. The coil is basically just a transformer. Now this is direct current on the outside, and remember that transformers only work with alternating current or pulsed current. So basically we can create pulsed current through the points opening and closing, you know, at whatever frequency. So each time that the points close, it, it charges up the primary winding, and then every time the points break open, it discharges the secondary winding to the distributor, and that's at a much higher voltage. So if you ever work on a CRT, they have a, a device called a, a flyback transformer. 
It's exactly the same as a coil, ignition coil. Now the other part of this is this ballast resistor. So the function of the ballast resistor is to basically compensate for the voltage drop during starting. So what happens is uh, when the starter motor engages, it basically pulls the entire system down. Let's say it pulls it down to like 10 or 8 volts and that basically affects the amount of voltage that's going to the coil. So what they do is they design the coil to basically work at 8 or 10 or even 6 volts. And when the engine's running normally, the power from the battery comes through the ballast resistor and into the coil and the ballast resistor reduces the voltage. So what happens is when the engine's running normally, power from the battery comes to one side of the ballast resistor, out the other side of the ballast resistor and into the coil. And this ballast resistor reduces the voltage from the battery from 12 volts on one side down to let's say 8 or so on the other side. Now when the engine is actually being started, so the starter motor is engaged, th there's a bypass wire that comes from the start position on the switch. So when you flip the key to the start position, it basically runs power through this wire and bypasses the ballast resistor. And because the starter motor is pulling the voltage down, the bypass wire is going to provide that same 8 or 10 volts that the coil is used to seeing. Now, most of the time you don't see a ballast resistor on a modern vehicle. So anyway, I hope that makes sense. I don't have a uh, ignition switch, so this wire here is just going to be connected to the, the primary wire on the starter. And then the bypass wire is connected to the, the start terminal on the starter solenoid. And when I hit my manual start button here, it'll basically apply power to the start terminal on the battery and it'll bypass the ballast resistor. So that's my ignition setup. Okay, partner. If you made it to this point in the video, congratulations. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's just you and me. I was going to fire this, this little hot rod up last night, but I decided it was better to uh, go home and get some sleep and come in in the morning and, and uh, hit it first thing with a clear head. So I, I don't see any reason why we can't start this little guy up. And uh, hopefully we did everything right and uh, she, comes, she comes to life. Now, the first things first, I've got a manual oil pressure gauge plumbed in and it's teed into the oil filter so we're gonna run it without uh, we're gonna crank it over without ignition and see if we get oil pressure it's a gear pump it's fully submerged in oil it's self priming this thing should have oil pressure pretty darn quick I mean within 10 cranks you know 10 rotations of the crankshaft we ought to have some kind of oil pressure now this engine uses a bypass oil filter so that means that oil basically bleeds off from the main system and it gets bypassed through the filter and then returns back to the pan. So that means that if we're teed into the filter, we may not actually get to read the, the actual system pressure, but we should see some kind of pressure drop through the filter, and that should be good enough to tell us, you know, tell us what's going on. Now, if you're working on a, a, a larger diesel engine, typically they'll have a, both a bypass filter and a full flow filter. This engine just has a bypass filter, and actually the older ones didn't even have any filters. So, uh, yeah, I got the batteries hooked up. Let's, uh, let's give her a little crank here. Okay, here's my oil pressure gauge, and this is my remote start switch. I bought this from that Snap-on guy years and years ago. They have cheaper ones now, but this thing is super handy for working on uh, any kind of engine. Just hook it up between the, the positive battery terminal and your solenoid, and uh, away you go. So here we go. Yeah, so we're already up to 15 PSI just cranking, so we're good on oil pressure. So let's throw some gas and some ignition to it and see if we can make a run. Now this thing has open exhaust, so might be a good time to grab some, uh, some hearing protection. And also, there's no coolant, so we don't want to be running this thing for very long. So if it fires up, 
we'll uh, we'll let it idle a little bit and then we'll shut it right down because uh, you know this flat head could easily crack without any coolant. Okay, so we've made some progress. The engine will fire up, but it won't stay running. And I don't think it's an ignition problem because it doesn't matter where I put the distributor, the, the problem remains. And I jumped around the ballast resistor and still couldn't get it to stay running. So I suspect that the problem is fuel delivery. And it may be icing up, you know, in this expansion valve deal here because I don't have any coolant plumbed through that. Or it may be that I'm not getting enough flow from this little cheesy barbecue tank. So. I need to, to rig up something better for that. Let's try that again. I got the real propane tank hooked up. Yeah, buddy, it runs good. Now, I've got the uh, ballast resistor bypassed, so I must have something goofed up in my wiring there. But uh, that's encouraging. So I'm going to bust out the timing light and see if we can get her, uh, get the timing dialed in. Okay, guys, it's pretty hard not to be happy with that. This thing runs perfectly. And I've got good oil pressure, 30 PSI at idle. I set the timing. I can't think of any way to, to actually film timing the engine, but you just need a timing light like this one. This, uh, this is a Sun. It's an antique, I'm sure, but it still works just fine. And yeah, cool. I, I've run it for just a few minutes. Like I said, I don't want to get it too hot because there is no coolant in it. But I don't see any, any oil leaks or anything crazy. I do have a... Uh, I'll show you here. So where the accessories bolt to the, the front cover, I just made these plywood kind of covers. And this one is leaking pretty bad. Probably, uh, you know, just the plywood's not flat or it chipped out or something. So no big deal there. The pan's not leaking. Okay, guys. So I'm pretty happy with how things turned out. You know, the engine runs good, as you saw. You know, obviously we can't put a load on it and, you know, really put it through its paces. But, you know, it just purrs like a kitten sitting there. You know, without any, any cooling in it, I just don't want to take a risk of, of overheating anything. So... We'll be very careful, just run it for a few seconds at a time. That was long enough to get it timed, and uh, yeah, I'm very happy with how it turned out. So, I hope you guys enjoyed uh, you know, watching this little adventure. You know, I've got the first two videos posted already, and it seems to be doing pretty well. A lot of good feedback. So as far as a multi-cylinder engine goes, this is about as simple as they get. But I think you can see from the videos so far that it's still a lot of hours. There's a lot of labor involved in rebuilding an engine. And I, I read somewhere one time that 40% of the labor hours for an engine rebuild is just on cleaning parts. And I assume that means surface prep and, you know, removing the grease and the grime and the old paint and scraping surfaces and all those things. That adds up to be a lot of time. And, you know, if you're in a big, you know, reman shop or whatever and you have, a, you know, an automated washing, you know, a belt line washing system or whatever, you know, it may not be such a big deal, but for for me, you know, washing the parts in the solvent tank or whatever, it, it's a lot of labor hours there. So the other time-consuming part is the measuring. Everything that goes back in the engine has to be inspected. Even the new parts have to be inspected, especially if you have aftermarket parts. You know, the variation on those parts can be, can be all over. So you don't want to get stuck, you know, putting a bad part into an engine because you're going to have to eat all that labor to go back in there and fix it. I've seen it happen before. Uh, the other thing about rebuilding engines, you do need a, a pretty large amount of specialized tools. You saw in the video, you know, you need things like ring compressors and dial bore gauges and torque wrenches and micrometers and, you know, if you want to get into the machining side of it, like I have a Sunnen hone that I use for the rod pins and I have an old Black & Decker valve seat grinder. I also have a form, carbide form tool that I use to cut valve seats on the mill. You know, that stuff can, can really add up, and if you want to get into boring or line boring or surfacing, there's a lot of specialized machines out there that, that they use to do those jobs. Different from regular machine tools because they're a lot more efficient for the automotive 
purposes, and you can really wrap up a lot of a lot of money doing that. That's why there are automotive machine shops out there, and uh, you know most people would just take their stuff to an automotive machine shop, and that's what I did. Now, the catch there. I've never seen an automotive machine shop in my life that was in anything that looked like a hurry. They take their sweet time. And if you're a, a small guy like me, you're going to be at the bottom of the list. And you got to wait your turn. And I don't know what to do about that. There's really nothing you can do about it. It, it just takes a lot of time. And it's like that everywhere. Uh, one more thing, if I can get on my soapbox for a minute. Notice when I put this engine together, I did use some RTV silicone. A tiny, tiny amount. Usually just where the gaps are in the gaskets, just to kind of prevent a leak. I don't use high tech, I don't use Permatex to glue the gaskets down. I put the gaskets on dry. And I don't know what it is about people, but they have a huge aversion to putting a gasket on dry. The purpose of the gasket is to form a seal. It doesn't need any help doing that. Uh, I'll link you to a video that was done by the Flat Rate Master, and he has a good example of a, I don't know if it was in a Volkswagen, it's a water pump that he removed that had a O-ring seal around the outside, and someone just slathered it in silicone. And I've got an example right here. Check out this old gasket. I pulled that off the power steering pump on this engine. See all the silicone hanging off that thing? If you want to destroy your engine, slather it with silicone like that. I've pulled so much silicone out of engine oil pickups and out of radiator cores, transmission coolers. This stuff just finds its way into every little nook and cranny. Uh, so there's OEM applications where they just use silicone and no gasket, like uh, power stroke oil pans, but they do it in a controlled way where the, you know, a precise amount of silicone is applied. It's given the adequate time to dry before the engine is run. It's a lot different than the guy, you know, the hero with the caulking gun out there squirting silicone everywhere. So there are cases maybe where you want to glue a gasket down too, such as like if you've ever worked on a Caterpillar engine, they have the, the jigsaw puzzle oil pan gasket. If you don't glue that down, it, it'll never stay in place, you know, while you're trying to put the oil pan up. Uh, some of the gas engine intake gaskets like, uh, for example, 300 inline six cylinder on a Ford, especially the, uh, the fuel injected ones. They like to, s the vacuum likes to suck the intake gaskets in, so maybe it's a good idea to glue those ones on. Uh, also, seems to be pretty common on some small engine crankcase gaskets, so I guess use your best judgment. But generally speaking, if there's a gasket, it can go on dry. Now, I don't know exactly what caused this engine to fail. All the components that I found were, were in pretty good shape. So I have a feeling that the, the maintenance was good, uh, but that is a big killer of these Continentals, especially in forklifts, is that they just don't get any maintenance. You know, a lot of times forklifts don't get a lot of hours put on them, so people don't, don't think about doing things like oil changes. And especially the, these uh, propane-powered engines seem to be really bad about condensation. And they get... You know, if you change the oil on one of these Continentals that's in a forklift, a lot of times you'll pull, you know, several quarts of oil out of the bottom of the oil pan before you get to oil. And you saw where the oil pan, you know, where the oil pump pickup is on this thing, it's right there at the bottom. So if you have a lot of condensation in your engine, it's sucking all water until it gets warmed up. And that's the problem. These, these forklifts, you know, a guy jumps on it, starts it up, drives it for five minutes and then parks it and the engine never gets up to operating temperature and you know that it needs to get up to temperature in order to, to cook all the water out of the oil and a lot of times with forklifts they're parked outside or in non-climate controlled areas and condensation is a major killer of these engines so anyway thanks for watching guys I'm not sure what I'm gonna do with the engine I'm probably gonna try to sell it I think there's a pretty good market for these Continental engines like I said they used them in everything and if I can't find someone that wants the Clark spec, then I, I would be happy to convert it to, you know, whatever spec they want, as long as they had the right front and rear cover. You know, and probably the manifold is different as well. But those are simple things to change. We know it runs. I wanted to assemble it and get it all put together so that we could run it and verify that, it, you know, it was a working engine. So to me, it was, it was very important to make sure that the engine runs. 
and you know good oil pressure and everything. I don't know if all of these reman companies actually run their engines before they ship them out. I suspect that a lot of them don't because you know I've been around a lot of reman engines and I've seen some pretty shady stuff and I feel like if they had run the engine on a test stand they would have found a lot of the issues that I had seen so I think it's, it's I certainly feel better about it knowing that I've seen the engine run myself.